see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Hi, it's Edwin Rutsch, and this is Dialogues on How to Build a Culture of Empathy, and I'm so pleased today to be here with uh, Christian Kiesers. Thank you, Christian, for joining me. Well, thank you for having this discussion with me. Yeah, so uh, you're a professor of, uh, of the social brain at the uh, Netherlands Institute for Neuroscience in Amsterdam. And you've uh, also written this book, which is behind you, The Empathic Brain, How the Discovery of Neur uh, Mirror Neurons Changes Our Understanding of Human Nature. So what we want to do in this dialogue was maybe just uh, go through the different uh, chapters of your book um, and just kind of uh, hear it, hear what you have to say about it. And, but before we start, is there anything else you'd like to say by way of introduction? Well, not really. I mean, the, the book is summarizing a bit uh, all the research I've done over the last 10 years. So by going through the book, we'll as well go through, through my life's work. Oh, great. And another thing is, is you were also, had also worked at the University of, uh, I guess, no, at Parma, Italy, at the university there, where they actually discovered mirror neurons. So uh, you were right there in the heart of it. Yes, so, so that was really a very exciting time that uh, kind of set off most of the research I'm doing now. I was very fortunate to, to be part of that. Yeah, so what we thought we'd do is I actually, actually, I have it on the screen here, the different chapters. And so I can show <laughs> the uh, chapters and uh, we can kind of uh, just kind of uh, then kind of chat about it a little bit and go over it. That sounds great. Okay. So, um, yeah, let's uh, start here with um, the introduction. Uh, introduction here says uh, connecting people. Yes, yeah, so, so, so I think the, the, the main spirit of this book is that we all know the fact that the humans have this almost uncanny capacity to feel what goes on in others. I mean, you, you can go to a wedding and you'll get incredibly emotional if you see the two you know, pairs basically feel very much about their own wedding. You'll get sad if, uh, if, if they're really sad. You get happy when they're happy. We go through that as well whenever we watch a good movie. So if you watch one of these cliffhanger movies where somebody's just holding off and falling off a roof, we kind of feel very, very much moved in part of what the, the other person is feeling. And I think what all of this book is about is to take this phenomenon that we all know, the phenomenon of empathy, and try to really look into the brain to try to see if we can understand how our brain allows us to do that, and then what it means for us, how our brain is capable of doing that. Yeah, you'd, uh, you'd started off uh, the book, I remember, with uh, the story of James Bond and the spider uh, crawling yes. up his arm and yes. how we feel that spider uh, crawling in the movie. Yeah, because I think when we, when we think about scenes like that with the tarantula on, on James Bond's chest, I think the, the really striking thing is that none of us needs to do much thinking to understand what Bond goes through. I mean, we can all kind of, we, we almost feel our own hands sweating, our heart beats stronger. We can maybe even feel a little itch on our shoulder. And kind of all of that just uh, happens. It's not like we have to think about it. And I think that's a, a very simple case that really illustrates how little empathy actually has to do with effortful, logical thinking. And, and I think this really sets us off to start taking seriously the fact that the brain is about more than just thinking. Okay, so um, then we have uh, chapter one, the uh, discovery of, of uh, mirror neurons. And I have here is perception like a sandwich from seeing to doing brain function based on connections uh, between neurons and uh, some other um, headings here as well. Yeah, so, so, so I think what, the, what I tried to do in this book 
is that I don't just want the reader to believe what I think the mirror system is doing for us. What I try to do with you is basically take you by the hand, let you into my lab, let you see the work we actually do so that you can then draw your own conclusions about uh, how mirror neurons really change our understanding of, of human nature. And so what I'm doing in this uh, first trio chapter in the book is I, I take you in the lab while, uh, while mirror neurons are really being discovered. You there, you can listen to the activity of a single neuron in the monkey while either the monkey is grasping a peanut and while the monkey witnesses somebody else grasp a peanut. And, and you get to witness the way that the single neuron that everyone before thought would only be involved in the monkey's own action actually responds as well while the monkey simply sees somebody else do a similar action. And, and by showing you the behavior of these neurons and telling you some of the background of what we know what this brain area is actually doing, I'm kind of uh, letting you conclude yourself the fact that now while you see somebody else do an action like grasping this cup, for instance, and drink from it, it's no longer a matter of just seeing somebody else grasp the cup, but you go through the experience, kind of the, the way it saves you from mourning and tiredness. And, and, <laughs> and, and all of these intentions, they are not in what you can actually see, because you cannot see intentions, all you can see is the cup. But you then feel all of these intentions and the meaning in a very intuitive way, just because your brain makes you go through the actions that you see. And I think that's the, the core of what this first chapter is about. And we might mention, too, you talked about uh, the discovery of mirror neurons in uh, Parma, Italy. With, there was a research lab there. And they actually had individual neurons wired, as I understand it. And every time that, and they were motor neurons, and every time they fired, it made a sound. And then once, uh, and it was, and it was a, uh, macaque monkeys is that right or correct yes and every time the monkey reached for you said it was a raisin i've heard so many different stories of what they were <laughs> reaching for but you're saying that they would reach for a raisin and then that neuron with that uh, is involved in this motor action would fire and make a sound and then once correct. the researcher came in and and then they were reaching for it and it's fired Yes, so, so, so the thing was that uh, in, the, in, in the lab, what was being studied at that moment was actually not social perception at all. It, we, we basically had electrodes in these parts of the brain of the monkey to understand how the monkey controls his own action. That was the reason for these recordings. But what happens is that you simply put the, the output from that neuron on a loudspeaker all the time. So you hear kind of pop, 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 and then the monkey is grasping and it goes brrrr, and then the monkey rest, it goes pop, 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 and then the, the monkey grasp another piece of food that you give him, and it goes brrrr again. So from that, people could understand, for instance, that this particular neuron is involved when the monkey wants to grasp something. Other neurons are active when the monkey, for instance, tries to tear something apart. And it was just by pure chance, because they always had the sound of the neuron in the background, that while well, they got hungry, for instance, and took one of these peanuts to eat it uh, themselves, they, they heard in the background how this neuron was firing exactly as if the monkey was grasping the neuron itself. And so it, it's because this kind of experimental setup led them to, to, um, to listen to the neuron as well, not while the neuron, uh, the monkey was doing what people wanted to study, but something else that they could really, by chance, discover this property. And, and then I joined the lab to, you know, because I was fascinated by this discovery to, to try to really understand a bit better what these neurons were doing. Well, this is kind of, in terms of uh, understanding empathy, it seems that this uh, mirror neurons is like this, this foundational uh, discovery of how empathy works. And it's like, um, just, it's so important to just understanding the whole uh, uh, process of empathy and experience of empathy. Yeah, I think absolutely. So the, the big thing is when, when we think back about the, the kind of 1990s, 
the, the dominant theory was actually that somewhere in the brain we have a specialized part that's responsible for making sense of the mind of other people. So, so the notion was very much that we had a kind of sandwich, like I call it uh, in the first chapter, so that uh, if, um, if you kind of see your, your child fall down and cry and you decide to pick up the child, there's actually three separate phenomena. There's a, a foundational layer of bread, which is kind of seeing your child fall down and cry. Then there's the, the interesting part in the classic theory, so the kind of juicy meat, which is how you then go from seeing a, a baby cry to really understand that the child is distressed. And everyone was specialized, was trying to find the part of the brain that was this juicy bit, that was doing this kind of thinking about the mind of others. And then helping the child was considered to be a third separate layer of boring bread again, which is how your motor system then helps you pick up the child. And what marine neurons really show is that searching for this layer of meat where you think about others was actually a mistake. And that the, the two things, vision and action, are directly connected. And, and what happens in your brain is that you see your child cry and you don't have to think about what it means. You kind of automatically kind of map it onto your own pain. And by doing so, you automatically know what you want to do to, to kind of alleviate that pain if you hurt yourself. And then you simply apply that to you and to your child. So we take away the abstract thinking from the sandwich model. And, and we, we create a new vision of the brain in which not everything goes through abstract kind of logical thinking. And you have these very direct connections between seeing the social world and acting and, and, and helping other people. Empathy, basically, finally discovered in the brain. Yeah, this is, this is uh, so exciting. Um, so the, uh, is that so chapter one? Is, this, uh, is there more to chapter one that you'd like to cover? Or? No, I think chapter one is really about kind of letting you witness a mirror neuron in the lab and, uh, and letting you kind of get a feeling for what it means 